to welcome everybody and thank them for coming to thank you for coming to tonight's uh, event. Uh, as everyone hopefully knew or hopefully you remember if you were here last time, last March we had one of the most uh, entertaining and, and engaging and, and informative author events we've had at this store in quite some time. And Ken let his guard down and uh, came back again, so I'm hoping that we can repeat that. Um, I'm someone who kind of came of age late. I was, uh, was one of the rare times where one of the younger people in the room, but uh, I, I kind of came of age in the, the mid-70s. So I missed an awful lot of what went around the first time. I did the best I could to try to catch up with the, the anti-war movement and the LGBT movement and a lot of the other progressive social civil um, rights movements. Um, and I really thought I was up to speed until I heard Ken speak last time, and until I, I read the first of the four volumes and found out there's some amazing things out there that I was completely unaware of. And I'll tip my hand real quickly, too. I've not read the second book yet, so I'm assuming by the time I leave today, I'll be even more well-informed. Uh, Ken was in instrumental in the underground press at MSU during the 1960s. And I, I think that the stories that you'll hear tonight, uh, if they're anywhere close to being as cool as the ones from the first go-round were, are going to be engaging and just as informative. So without further ado, Ken Washburger. Well, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. And it's great to be back here. It really is. Uh, when I spoke here last time, it was really one of the best events of my life. I really uh, had a great show. I loved the turnout. And so it's really nice to be back. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, if you were here the last time, thanks for coming again. And uh, if Scott invites me to come back for volume three and volume four, thanks in advance for coming. There's some great <laughs> stories in there. So, uh, so I hope you come. But, uh, but tonight I'm real pleased to be talking about Michael Kindman. Uh, and I look forward to hearing what other folks have to say later on. Uh, Michael was important to me because uh, my experience with the underground press uh, was the most important experience of my formative adult years. Uh, and Michael was one of the pioneers of the underground press. Uh, he was important to a number of you because he was a friend. Uh, we knew him as Michael. Later on in his life, he became known as Micah. Uh, I like to think that I knew him, Michael better than anyone in the world who never met him. Uh, I never met him. It took him two years to write his story. And during the time that we worked together, we communicated over the phone. Uh, we communicated over the mail. Now, now we call it snail mail because we have email to compare it to, but then we didn't really have email, so it was just the regular mail and the phone. But I never met him in person. Uh, I never shook his hand, never hugged him, uh, never saw his facial expressions as we discussed philosophy. But his name loomed large to me because he was the founder of the paper, which was the first underground paper in East Lansing, uh, and also was one of the first five members of Underground Press Syndicate, which was the first major network of underground paper. So Michael was uh, an important figure, but, but to me, you know, my experience with the underground press came two underground press generations later, when I started working on uh, Joint Issue, which was the underground paper of the early 70s here. I say two generations. You had the paper, and then you had uh, kind of a group of papers, Swill and Squeal, uh, Generation... <laughs> Oh, is, that, is that yours, Charlie? Okay. I like Swill and Squeal. That was a good one. All three issues. <laughs> They're great issues, though. S Swill and Squeal, Generation, Bogue Street Bridge, and Red Apple News. All kind of... What was that? Yeah. Okay, okay. No, that was later. That was later. We're talking generations. Those were the, the generation that followed uh, the paper. And then after that was, was uh, Joint Issue. And so uh, two generations apart, I always thought of Michael as my spiritual grandfather, although I'm sure if I'd ever told him that he would have probably laughed. But that was how, uh, always how I felt about him. Um, he was also important on the national level, very important. When I began, when I began compiling stories uh, for what became the first edition of Joint Issue, which came out in 1993, uh, I was talking to one prospective author yes. and telling him uh, some of the stories that I wanted, that I, were going to be in it already. Some of the, the papers that already had committed to being part of it, some of the writers who were going to be uh, writing for it. And uh, when I mentioned Michael's name, he, he stopped me. He said, and he didn't know I was from East Lansing. We were just talking over the phone. He stopped me and he said, I got to tell you, Michael really influenced my life, my, my experience uh, as a radical. He, was, he himself was one of the key figures back then. And he was telling me how important Michael was to him. Uh, later on, when I began uh, 
preparing for, for this edition. Now, this is uh, just a, qu a quick background. This is the, actually the second edition of Voices from the Underground. It came out originally in 1993. Uh, it was, a, four, it was a, a, a huge book, 600 pages, laid out in an 8.5 by 11 two-column format. It was literally the equivalent of four books. I mean, literally four books. And Michael's was the longest story in it. So when I began uh, creating uh, the, the second edition, which is an updated and expanded version of the first, uh, Michael's, I knew Michael's had to be its own book, and, and so now it is. I'm real pleased about that. But when I was in the process of, of preparing it, I read the manuscript over again just to, uh, you know, to, to, to get psyched up for the, for the new adventure of creating its own book. And I was reminded that uh, Paul Krasner had been part of the paper. He had done just a small role. Uh, he had called the paper one time uh, and asked to do a fun offered to do a fundraiser for them. Uh, now anybody who's part of the 60s period knows Paul Krasner. He was one of the legends himself. He founded, uh, founded The Realist in, I believe, 1959. Uh, he was one of the co-founders of the Yippies. Uh, but uh, he was called, some people consider him the father of the underground press. Uh, when he heard that, he immediately demanded a paternity test. But, uh, <laughs> but, but um, uh, it actually was People Magazine that called that, so, so you don't have to, you know, it doesn't have a whole lot of credibility, but, but it did get out, he's the father of the underground press. Uh, so anyhow, when, when I saw that he was part of it, and by the way, he, he did do the fundraiser. They had an interesting discussion at it. Um, they, they, they talked about ver various ways to say fuck communism, ball communism, bed communism, uh, uh, meaningful relationship communism. <laughs> it must have been a pretty wild conversation, but, but this was Paul Krasner. So when I read that, I said, I said he's got to be part of this book. I, you know, I was looking for someone to write the foreword. So I, I contacted him, and he got back to me, and he said, Ken, I've got to tell you, I've done a lot of writing over the years, but I've never written a novel. In all my life, I've never written a novel. And now, for the first time, I'm writing my novel. He said, I've put aside all my writing, all my other projects, all my tasks. He was devoting full time to writing his novel. And I was quite sure that what he was doing was giving me a, a polite way to say, so I'm sorry, I can't accept your offer. But instead he said, but I got to tell you, I was really intrigued by your offer, and I would be honored to write the foreword. So and that's, you open up the book, that's the first part of the text you see, uh, Paul Krasner's foreword. Really, really honor, and a real tribute, I think, to Michael. That's, that, that's uh, really the point. Uh, what is the underground press? That's what we're talking about. Most of you, I'm sure, know about it, but some of you may not. So I want to just, just briefly say that uh, the underground press was the dissident press, the anti-war press, the non-corporate press uh, during the Vietnam years. Uh, there, were, uh, there were papers representing the, the gay, the lesbian, the feminist, the black, the Native American, the Puerto Rican, the military, the, the uh, southern consciousness, the prisoners' rights, the rank and file, the new age, the psychedelic, the socialist, all these different voices of what we knew of as the anti-war movement, and the counterculture, all of them had their own underground papers. They were all united against the war. But beyond that, they all spoke to different audiences. And so uh, my goal when I began conceptualizing voices from the underground was to capture as many of these voices as I could. And so, uh, so one day I was talking to Charlie Shively on the phone. Charlie was one of the key figures on a paper called Fag Rag. Uh, Fag Rag was one of the, the gay papers that, that was an outgrowth of the Stonewall Rebellion. The Stonewall Rebellion in 1969, that was when gays and lesbians, you know, gays and lesbians that used to get, their bars used to get busted on a regular basis. And uh, it would just, you know, they get busted, then everything would resume to normal, they get busted again. It was just a regular uh, harassment. One day, one night, they fought back. They said no. And then they fought the cops. It was just amazing. And, and this went on for like three nights. And, and what happened as a result of this was gay lesbian uh, consciousness rose to a level, I'd say in this country, probably in the world, I don't know, that, that's never been achieved before. And by the time that was done, there were uh, gay liberation front chapters all over the country. And a lot of them had their own newspapers. So you had, in Detroit, you had the Gay Liberator. In uh, San Francisco, you had Gay Sunshine. And so in Boston, we had Fag Rag, and that was the paper that I was, I was uh, looking at right now. I was talking to Charlie, and uh, Charlie had just agreed at this point to write his history. So I was real excited about that. His history, by the way, will be in Volume 3, the one that's coming up. So we were talking afterwards, just kind of the afterglow, I guess, of my getting a, uh, another contributor. And uh, I asked him if he was 
if he knew anybody who had been an insider with a paper called Avatar. Now, Avatar, I knew about that because uh, Avatar was a member of Underground Press Syndicate, like Joint Issue. And we used to exchange. All the, all the UPS, Underground Press Syndicate, papers used to exchange. So I got all these papers from all over the country, and I read them all. I just loved doing that. And this was one of the papers, and it was a, I was really attracted to it. It was uh, an anti-war paper, like all the Underground Press uh, papers, but it was different. It talked less about war and more about personal development. Uh, less about hatred, more about poetry. Uh, at least that was, that was the impression that I had of it back when. And so I was attracted to it. But by the time I began compiling stories for Voices from the Underground, uh, I knew a little bit more about it. What I learned was that uh, Avatar was put out by a group called uh, the Fort Hill Community. And the Fort Hill Community was a personality cult that revolved around uh, a musician turned cult leader <coughs> named Mel Lyman. And uh, I've never been a fan of cults, but I figured, okay, this is the, you know, the 60s and the 70s were a period where there were a lot of cults. I mean, you know them, you know, the, the, the Jim Jones group in San Francisco, uh, we had the Moonies, uh, we had the Divine Light Mission, you know, the 13-year-old kid from India who was, uh, you know, the, the, the perfect master, and a lot of white suburban kids were falling in line behind him. And uh, so anyhow, there were a lot of cults, and I thought, well, okay, they were putting out a paper. I wanted to get an insider perspective. I thought that would be really interesting. Uh, the Fort Hill community was, was actually um, one of the main one, uh, a key one. It was written about in uh, David Felton's book. It was a classic book called Mindfuckers. Uh, and he focused on a couple of these groups, but the two main ones he focused on were the Fort Hill community and another group that some of you might have heard of, Charlie Manson's group. The family, okay? So these were, these were the two groups that he's focusing on, and one of them is Avatar. Uh, and so by the time I was talking to Charlie on the, uh, you know, about, about uh, Voices from the Underground, by this time I knew about Avatar. But I still thought, okay, I'd like to be, have an interesting side of the story. So I asked him if, if he knew of anybody uh, who had been a key person on Avatar. They were both from Boston. That was the connection there. So he said to me, well, I know somebody who was part of it, but he was kind of peripheral. And I thought, well, okay, the way I got people to write stories, I always wanted the key people, not just anybody, but key people who were really insiders. But in order to get to them, all I needed was anybody from the staff. And then I would talk to that person. If that was the wrong person, I'd say, well, who, who would you recommend? And they'd catch me someone else, I'd get someone else. Eventually, I could find the right person. So peripheral was good. That was the foot in the door. So he said, uh, he said, you know, someone who's kind of peripheral, his name is Michael Kinman, he's living out in San Francisco, he's going by the name of Micah now. I said, okay, cool. So I called up this, this Michael Kinman, this is 27 years later, uh, you know, from when it actually happened. I called up Michael Kinman, and I explained the project to him, and what I was looking for, and I said, could you write a history of Avatar? And he said to me, well, I was part of the paper, you know, he agreed with with uh, what Charlie said, it was kind of peripheral to it. He said, I could write the, a story if you wanted. But he said, but I was really better known for my association with a paper from the Midwest. And that's all he said. I mean, I did, again, I didn't tell him I'm from East Lansing, uh, or I was living in Ann Arbor at the time, but either way, I didn't say that. He said, a, a paper from the Midwest. And suddenly I had this catharsis. I said, oh my God, you're Michael Kindman. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm sure... I'm sure this is one of the most profound realizations of the obvious that, that's ever been recorded. I mean, I called asking for Michael Kinman. He said, I'm Michael Kinman. I said, oh, you're Michael Kinman. Uh, yeah, I felt like an idiot, but, but, uh, but any, so, so we started talking. He said, well, I'd be happy to write it. Which one would you like me to do? And he said, I'm also out in San Francisco. I've worked on papers out there. Which one would you like me to write? So I made what probably was one of the best journalistic decisions of my life. I said, just tell me your story. And the result is Michael's Odyssey through the underground press. Uh, I had no idea it was going to be that long. Uh, most of the stories, the stories in the anthologies are 20, 30 pages. Uh, his is, yeah, it was a book. Um, but it was an amazing story. Um, I mean, it, it's funny at times, it's sad at times. Uh, it's inspirational at times. Sometimes it's just a real bummer, uh, but it's 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 brilliant. I mean, he uh, you know it's insightful, uh, and clearly it's passionate. I mean, the whole book he, he's passionate about what he was saying. He really, really had a story that he had to tell, 
And um, I think part of it was because he went through this cult experience and he was living with this experience that he had to get down on paper. Uh, but it was way more than I expected, but it was great. I loved hearing it. Uh, it begins in 1963 uh, when he came to MSU. Uh, he was one of 200 brilliant high schoolers from around the country who had been given uh, national merit scholarships that were good only at MSU. <laughs> only this was the period when, uh, when MSU was trying to, to shed its reputation as the Cow College, Mu Yu. Okay, he was trying to, to, to develop its, its reputation as a, a great center of learning. So he invited all these, these national merit scholars, and these national merit scholars came with this idea of, you know, they, they figured they were coming to some kind of a mecca, some kind of a, uh, an intellectually stimulating environment. Instead, they came to Mu Yu. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so immediately, some of them started you know, looking elsewhere. I mean, they, they weren't satisfied here. They started looking elsewhere. Uh, Michael... Uh, got a job on, on State News, which is the, the school newspaper. Uh, he worked as a writer, he worked as an editor, and uh, in this, this uh, position he started to get, you know, learn a little bit more about what was happening off campus in the surrounding community. And so uh, he got in with some of the anti-war folks. Not because he was seeking it out, I think they actually sought him out, I can't remember, but, but they met, you know. And, and so he became aware of, the, of this country in Southeast Asia called Vietnam. And, uh, he became aware of, of uh, the open housing issues that were happening around that, around that time, and he began to write about them. And it, it didn't fit real well with the uppers at the state news. And so, uh, so they began trying to censor him in, in, in various ways, and he, he saw this. Thank you. He felt this, and... Uh, he finally said, no, this is, I don't like this anymore. And he dropped out, and he found it in the paper. And, uh, and so in his role as the paper, this brought a, a great group of radicals together. They wrote again about Vietnam. They wrote about uh, open housing, but they covered other issues as well. Uh, you know, as, as uh, an organizer, we know that when we want to bring the people from here to there, you don't start out there. You've got to go to where the people are and, and move forward. Well, the, the people on campus, students, what were their issues back then? It seems really quaint to talk about it right now, but the issues then were women's hours. Okay, remember the men could stay out as long as they wanted. Women had to be back at midnight. Uh, Co-ed dorm. What's that? Eleven. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Except on weekends. I just know I had to buy flowers all the time because I got because <laughs> I got them back late. Um, but uh, um, co-ed dorms. Co-ed dorms. You know, you had. Uh, in Wonders, you had North Wonders for the, the men, South Wonders for the women. Uh, so, so these were issues, and, and these are other issues that revolved around uh, the, the common theme of what we knew then as in loco parentis. Okay, remember that? In loco parentis, which means basically uh, when you go away to school, the, the school takes the role of your parent. I was at local parents, I thought it meant your parents are crazy, <laughs> but, but that's not what it meant. It meant that, it meant that the, parents take your, uh, the, the school takes your place. And so this became a big issue, and, and so, uh, so the paper wrote about that. And then there was another issue, uh, the, the classic issue, really what, what put, um, put the paper on the map. Uh, this, this was a period when MSU was expanding expanding tremendously, not only, not only bringing in more people, but, but physically the area was, was getting bigger and bigger. They are building dorms, they were getting more land. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the, the dorms on the Far East, uh, Acres, Fee, Hubbard, if I'm not mistaken, uh, according to the uh, original game plan of expansion, that was supposed to be the center of campus. Uh, but I'm not sure about that, but that's what I've always heard. But, but the funds dried up. What happened was that... Uh, MSU was the number one front organization for the CIA's expansion in, in Vietnam. Uh, I mean, Vietnam, you know, the, the CIA was, was uh, carting the, uh, the, the peasants, you know, pushing the peasants from the, the country into the cities and then and, uh, IDing them. You know, this is what we were doing to the Vietnamese. And it was costing a lot of money and, and the government didn't want to know what was happening. So the government paid MSU give all this money to MSU, and MSU just sent it right over to Vietnam. And so you had people working in Vietnam who were called professors, who never showed up on campus. They were in Vietnam all the time. Uh, so this was a huge scandal. 
And uh, although we didn't know about it until a, a ma magazine, the number one muckraking magazine at the time, Ramparts, came to town and worked with Michael and some of the other people from the paper to, to expose what was going on. And it was a huge scandal. Gary, you got to step Gary, forward. Got to step forward. Get the camera on Gary. That uh, t shirt that he's wearing. Is the cover of the Step forward more. I didn't pay him to do this. This was uh, just a coincidence. Just a coincidence. That's the co that was the cover. That was the cover of Ramparts magazine. That's April Madam of New. April of Madam, yeah. Madam, yeah. MSU yeah. Madam New on an MSU cheerleaders. Yeah. <laughs> and John Hanna inside is the coach. Yeah. <laughs> so that was great, but that was the cover of, of the magazine that, that had the expose. And the paper wrote about this also, but this was a huge, uh, a huge uh, expose, and the paper was part of it. So this is what, what Michael was, was involved in while he was working on the paper. But at some point around 1968, I think it was, uh, it was three years after he'd founded the paper, uh, he started looking eastward. Uh, they were members, of course, of UPS also. I told you uh, the paper was one of the first five members. So he was reading uh, copies of Avatar too, And he looked at it and he was very impressed by this paper. And so he and a friend of his went uh, east to visit the Avatar staff. And they were welcomed by the paper there by the whole community, the Fort Hill community, and they became part of it. And I think, I mean, he didn't know it was a cult. I mean, who knew about cults in 1968? But, uh, but I think, you know, from my reading of the book, from my reading of his story, I think that they knew that who he was. I mean, they knew he was, you know, a, a big leader in East Lansing, that he was well-respected. I believe that they really tried to beat him down. I mean, they, they didn't want him to... You know, they weren't going to treat him as an equal. They didn't want him to be, you know, one of the leaders, maybe be threatening or something. So they really, really mind-messed him. I mean, you know, the mind fuckers, that was the name of, the, of David Felton's book. Uh, his friend, she was welcomed right in, no problem. Uh, Michael never, he never really was able to, to uh, be one of, the, one of the group. I mean, it, it, I didn't think so. He always was, always was struggling with it. Sometimes he'd be welcomed in. Sometimes he'd be uh, ostracized. Uh, he, he worked on the paper then, you know, partly, but he also worked as a, as a carpenter, you know, uh, the building, that, that was his real profession besides writing. And um, so he never, uh, never really was able to, to blend in with the group. There was always that, that stress. And, and so, you know, like, like cults, what they do, you know, part of him wanted to be part of it. You know, there's a sense of belonging. This is my community now. Uh, and so he really tried to become part of it. But then there was part of him that said, well, this is really screwed up. I got to get out of here, and so I know, you know, I could see that he was going both ways at the same time. Uh, you know, I mean, once you got your family, it's hard to leave them, uh, as much as some people try. Uh, so, so, uh, so it took him a long time. It took a long time to, to get away. But finally, uh, five years after he he uh, joined the group, uh, he was at this point living uh, in Kansas, which is a, 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 a western outpost of the group. So he's still part of the. Of, of the Fort Hill community, but he was living in Kansas, he finally made his escape. And, uh, and it's not like they had guns on him. I mean, it wasn't that kind of escape. He wasn't behind bars, but it was a mental thing. You know, he had to get away. And uh, he went out west. No, he uh, came here first. He stayed at my house. Okay, you're right. You're right. Thank you, Maggie. Okay. <laughs> but, ultimate, but the ultimate flow, the ultimate flow, thank you, though. The ultimate flow was, was he went out west. Um, he came out uh, as a gay man changed his name to Micah, and by the time I caught up with him, he was working with a, uh, a group, as a radical, it was a, uh, a gay pagan spiritual group called Radical Fairies. Uh, real important group, it was founded by Harry Hay. Uh, Harry Hay was the founder uh, in the, the 50s of the Mattachin Society, uh, which was one of the first major gay groups, maybe the first, I'm not sure, uh, major gay group uh, around. They had their own paper called the Mattachin Review, uh, which was one of the three major gay lesbian papers of the 50s. They had that paper, you had a paper called The One, and you had a paper called The Ladder. Uh, but this was the first one. So this was Harry Hay who founded this. Now later on, uh, he founded out, out west the paper called, uh, the, the group called The Radical Fairies. Uh, so when I caught- It was also the first gay group in San Francisco to have a clinic for AIDS patients. The Radical Fairies? Yes. Okay, excellent, I didn't know that. clinic was by M Michael. Thank you, thank you. So by the time, anyhow, so, um, so uh, uh, it was because of, of my awareness. You know, when, I, when I first uh, 
became interested in, in him writing uh, his piece, I didn't know he was gay at that time. I mean, I was attracted to his underground pressness. Uh, and that's why I wanted Paul Krasner to write a forward. I mean, it really fit. You know, he's underground press. Paul Krasner, it really was, was great. But once I realized that he was gay, I said, okay, this has to be a major part of the story also. And so I was real pleased that uh, Tommy Avacoli Mecca, who is a, uh, a gay activist, writer, uh, a former underground press person himself, worked with some of the gay papers in, uh, in Philadelphia in the 60s and 70s. Uh, he wrote the second forward to my this piece. So I was really, really honored that, that he agreed to write that. Uh, so this is what I knew about Micah but by the time I caught up with him, but there was one other thing. Uh, he was dying of AIDS. And uh, real sad, I mean, I, you know, who knew? But, but, uh, but he was positive, he was always positive, and um, always positive. He really believed he was gonna make it past, you know, survive, but uh, he did. Two, year, two months after finishing his, his manuscript, uh, I got a, a call from his partner that he passed away. Uh, so it was really sad, but uh, I really believe that he lived that extra period because he was writing his story. Uh, I mean, ironically, uh, ironically, he was the second person whose, whose story I wrote who died soon after finishing the story with me. Uh, that may explain, there must be a that may, ex <laughs> may explain why I can't get people to work with me anymore. But, but uh, no, but, but really, I, I believe he lived that extra time because of that. I mean, this is really a, uh, it is a whole another story, but this is a whole testament to the power of words. Uh, and writing for self-discovery. I've taught that as a class, uh, writing for self-discovery, and, and his story really showed that to me. But, uh, but he ultimately died. Uh, meanwhile, during this period, I was trying to find a publisher for the first edition. And uh, you know, I had this huge book, and I had an agent who was really interested, you know, one of the big wig uh, New York agents, loved the book, and he was passing it around to the different houses, and they were, you know, they were liking the book, but not going with it. One of the, one of the, the, uh, the publishers he contacted, that I was holding on to the book for a long time. Finally, the agent said, you know, what's the story? Do you want it or don't you? He said, oh, I'm sorry. He apologized for taking so long to return. He said, I was reading it. <laughs> I mean, in other words, he really liked that. Another guy, another publisher gave it, quote, unquote, a rave rejection. He said, Love the book. <laughs> Love the book. Don't want to publish it. Uh, so this is what we were getting. I, I think that, you know, this was the early 90s. I like that. It was in the early 90s. The government was not at this point, and, and society, I think, wasn't really ready to deal with the fact that we had lost the Vietnam War. We'd gotten pounded in the Vietnam War. And in fact, that we were actually the bad guys in Vietnam. I mean, it's, you know, this, this was the real lesson that we learned from Vietnam, and I don't think... Some of us learned. Some of them, well, those of us who are writing this particular book. Uh, so, so I don't... Uh, so it was real tough to, to find a publisher. And somewhere along the way, as this was happening, uh, we started to realize that in the same way that the underground press of the 60s and 70s had been created in order to get the story of what was happening in Vietnam out to the people, now in the 90s we were going to have to create our own publishing house in order to get the story of that story uh, out to the people. And so we created the press to do it and we named it Mike the Press. So... Um, so that's, uh, that, that's the story. Uh, tonight we're, we're celebrating Micah's life, uh, and uh, I look forward to hearing what folks have to say, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much.